Welcome everyone to Woody Ornamentals from Field to Market. Uh, my name is Jay Kundert. I'm the Food Systems Director with the Iowa Valley RCND, and I'm here with Calvin Franzenberg uh, from Pheasant Run Farm and Ann Armitage from Moss Plant Shop, both of whom have experience growing uh, and on Ann's side uh, selling some um, of the uh, Woody Ornamentals that we'll talk about here in this presentation. Uh, just to start off, I wanted to give a just a real quick overview of our organization. We're the Iowa Valley RCND. We're based in Amana, and we're a nonprofit that focuses on enhancing quality of life for Iowans by strengthening food systems, leading collaborative placemaking projects, and bringing technical assistance to rural communities. And this Woody Ornamentals project that uh, we'll be talking about with this presentation fits nicely. Uh, we have kind of on the side here these four uh, scopes of work that our organization focuses on. So community, food, farming, and environment. And I think this Woody Ornamentals project fits nicely within the, the farm and uh, environment sector. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is here in a second. So we started this Woody Ornamental uh, trial here in uh, 20, late 2018. And uh, plants got in the ground in 2019. And the goal was really to develop a production system in Iowa and uh, assess the market potential for woody ornamentals um, here in Iowa. Uh, funded through Iowa Specialty Crop Block Grant. And we partnered with and are partnering with seven farms here in eastern Iowa on this project. Um, and each farm chose uh, some slightly different options for what they're growing and how they're growing them. And I, what excites me about this project is that we're focusing on a lot of kind of diverse produce farms. And the value of woody ornamentals that we think uh, will happen on these farms is that it fits within a niche in the winter uh, and late fall where they can be perennial crops that will be focused on uh, harvesting and marketing in that kind of winter off season. So uh, both providing uh, cash flow during that time of the year that might otherwise be kind of slow and also have farmers have likely have more time in that time of the year. So you can kind of uh, stretch out the, the time of the season that you're, you're producing in. So on those seven farms, we grew uh, a variety of different kinds of woody ornamentals. What mostly ended up being was a, 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 quite a few different types of uh, willows, and then a couple different kinds of dogwoods, and then a couple other, um, a couple other different kind of perennial bush crops like uh, witch hazel. Um, those were all planted in May to August in 2019. And the planting stock all came from uh, uh, three different places, um, well, I guess four. So uh, Bailey's Nursery, Double A Vineyards, and Coldstream Farm, and then as well as some local cuttings. Uh, that actually came from um, the farm that Ann uh, used to farm on and, and had some existing woody ornamentals on there. Uh, along with this, the production size of the project, we're also trying to assess the market interest. So we've done a survey with Floris and among other things, I found that these are the top five uh, species and varieties that they're looking for. So red twig, dogwood, pussy willow, curly willow, birch cuttings, and winterberry. Um, and so that's kind of helping to inform the producers on what types of things they should be growing on their farm to meet the, the need of the market. Okay, so that's what I have, and then I'm gonna throw it over to, to Calvin to take over and start talking about what uh, they're all doing at Pheasant Run Farm. Um, and then just a little housekeeping, I will keep an eye on the chat box for questions as we go along, um, but uh, we'll mostly focus all the questions towards the end of the presentation here. Um, so Calvin will present and then Ann will present, and we can do questions at the end. Um, so you can chat, add into the chat box and we'll, we'll cover them at the end, um, but you're also be welcome to uh, unmute yourself and ask questions at the end as well. So if you want to take over, Calvin, it's all yours. All righty. So my name is Calvin Franzenberg, and I'm, I guess you could say, the lead flower grower at Pheasant Run Farm. We've been growing cut flowers and other woodies for about 10 years now. I've taken over the last three. And uh, I'll be going over some harvesting and storage tips 
and marketing tips for the ornamentals we've been handling. Harvesting seems to be pretty straightforward for the most part, and it falls in line with a lot of other woodies that we've grown in the past. Um, the time of harvesting for dogwoods and willows is after the leaves are shed or before, so it could be early, early spring or late fall during the winter. Just kind of depends on when you want to sell them. I don't think I would recommend cutting them at both. You would probably just want to pick one. The other thing to keep in mind is that you don't want to overcut or else your production will be stunted for the rest of next year. So a good rule of thumb is to only cut a third of the branches that are on the plant. Um, always sanitize your shears or anything before you cut. That way you can limit the amount of bacteria and disease that could occur. Um, and also cut the branches where they join up with the main stem is also a good way to go about it. That way you don't get those crappy little offshoots off the little nubs. That way your branches are just nice and long and straight. Um, I think, I mean, if you've cut woodies in the past, there's really not, I haven't seen much difference between the red twig dogwood and willows compared to say like Diablo nine bark or viburnums or anything like that. So, um, and there's not really a need to make a vertical cut along the stem because you're not going to store the water. So I would bypass that step. So for post-harvest handling, you want to make sure that you keep the stems upright. That way you can maintain the straightness of the stem. That's what florists are really looking for, I think, for the most part is a nice straight stem, unless it's a curly willow, of course. Um, so you don't want to lay them up against the wall and then they'll get a bow in the middle of them. Um, allow for ample airflow. Um, if you are going to lay them flat on the floor, I would raise them up with something that has maybe some holes underneath of it. That way the air can travel underneath and they don't rot from the bottom. Um, but, and also when you store them, you don't want to store them where the sun can get to them or else they're going to bleach the color and it'll, it'll be very muted. So always make sure that you store them in a dark, dry place. Um, because yeah, if you leave red twig dogwood outside in the sun to dry it, you're going to lose that bright, bright red that the florists are really looking for and it's going to be very pale. So, and it's, it's just really going to hurt the integrity of your product and the quality of it. So, like I said, you don't need to storm water because I mean, it's just a branch. They can dry and they'll be fine. Um, and then the nice thing about woodies, obviously, especially the red twig dogwood and the willows, because there's, you're not really doing it for the foliage, it's just for the branches, is you can storm indefinitely. I mean, I would say well over a year, maybe. Um, and then also, I would say, I would bunch them in tens personally, because they're not super thick. And that way, um, and that way when you, uh, well, that can also be used for marketing, but I'll go over that here soon. Um, so for marketing, like I said, I would bunch them in tens for me personally as a grower. It's a lot easier to deal in tens than it is to like, if you're dealing with a florist that's like, oh, I only want one or two branches. It's just not really worth my time. So I would make a minimum order 10 just because, I mean, you can bunch them in tens. You don't have to count anything out. You just grab the bunch. And that's, that's it. I mean, or fives, if you're a smaller grower, I suppose would work as well. So for marketing, I mean, this isn't really my expertise, but you could use them for value added products, especially the willows. You could use them to make baskets or wreaths out of, and then sell those at the farmer's markets or on your online store. Um, obviously wholesale to florists, that's mostly what I'm interested in. Um, the best way to sell to a florist is to always just go to the shop with whatever you have and show it to them. Florists are very visual people, so they want to see what you have. You can't just send them an email or give them a call and be like, hey, I have this. Because, I mean, they're busy people too, and can speak to that, I'm sure. But 
they they're going to want to see the product and know that it's actually up to par and up to their standards. So I would always recommend traveling to the florist in person and talking to them. Um, and I'll, also, um, we're to the point now where I can only make, I'm pretty much maxed out on clients for deliveries because I don't have enough time in the day to stop it really anymore. So the upside of having the woodies is that I can easily ship those across the state or even you know out of the, out of the state if need be if we ever get to that point we're not to that point yet but maybe one day um, so yeah shipping would be very easy you know I can't drive to Northwest Iowa obviously but I can definitely ship them there and I think that would be a good way to expand your clientele base um, you know and if you are a farmer florist it's great for your adding um, structural integrity to your floral arrangements centerpieces and all stuff like that. And then also if your plants get big enough, you could you could definitely sell the cultivars as well, you know, make cuttings and sell those as roots and you know to other growers that are interested in getting in the market as well. I think that pretty much does it for me. So there we go. There we go. All right, Anne, you want to take over the screen share there? Uh, sure. Bear with me here. I don't do a lot of these, so okay. I'm... Okay. All right, so I, um, I'm Ann Armitage, and um, I... Um, about 10 years ago or so, my husband and I lived on 14 acres in Tama County. And when we got there, we had a, pretty much a, a blank slate of a property with very few trees. And um, in some of those first years, we took a couple of cuttings from my mom's uh, curly willow tree and got those going and were amazed that in you know, quickly in a year or two, we had some actual full-size trees and we were intrigued by willow. So uh, I guess in the winter, um, it probably all started with doing more research on different ornamental willows and planning um, plantings for the following year. Um, so in this, in this photo, you can see there's some, um, Japanese giant pussy willow with the uh, extra plump catkins, uh, some curly willow in there, and then um, a sweet little variety of pussy willow that, uh, that I found early on called uh, Salix uh, Koryanagi rubicans. It's on blonde wood and has teeny tiny little pink uh, catkins. And, this photo was actually a, an assorted um, branch bouquet that we, probably one of the first willow products that we marketed early on. Um, and I'm, I'm talking 10 or 12 years ago on eBay and Etsy, but turned out to be pretty popular because people got a whole bunch of different varieties in one box. And some people were buying it for just to use as an ornamental arrangement in their home. And then uh, others, uh, I think we're making cuttings for, for planting. Uh, so around, around that time, about 10 years ago, we also uh, started, started a business and Willow became a central part of that in the beginning. We, I would say that we never set out to try to compete with the big um, branch farms, big growers of woody ornamentals. Instead, we kind of tried a lot of different little um, creative things to see what would go over well. Um, and so we, the things that we did with Willow ranged from actually starting willow cuttings and gallon containers and growing little trees and starts to sell at farmers markets, 
selling uh, cuttings of the different varieties of willows that we grew and uh, shipping those across the country. We also shipped um, boxes of uh, branches as well uh, and uh, even some wreaths, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a little bit. So um, our business, um, you know, that was 10, 12 years ago. Our business has evolved since, and now we, now we focus pretty much exclusively on house plants. Um, still love willows. We're living on a different property in Cedar Rapids now, and we did, uh, we did bring a lot of cuttings of our favorite varieties to replant, and I'll, um, I'll show you. Let's see here. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Okay. So this is our current uh, willow uh, planting on the edge of our property there. And there's me walking so you can kind of see the height. We've got, um, sorry, go back here just a second. So we've got, uh, we've got a few rows of um, the Japanese pussy willow or the giant pussy willow. This was this was a very versatile um, crop for us to grow. And we kind of replanted here on our new property with the intention of um, using it as a privacy hedge. And then it could also double as stock for, um, for different product offerings too. So um, we, uh, we, learned a lot from all of our trial and error um, plantings out on our original farm that Jason mentioned earlier on. Um, I would say in the very beginning, um, I could not resist the temptation to plant willows too close together, even though um, I had read not to do it, uh, did it anyway. Um, and, I can, and I can confirm that it's really not a good idea to do that. Um, you, can't, you can get diseases and bugs um, if there's not sufficient airflow. And so here um, in the hedges that you see on our current property, we have planted, um, I don't know, they're 100 foot rows, cuttings directly into landscape fabric, but then we have, um, we have mown stretches of grass in between the rows and we've never had Never had a, a disease problem since. Uh, we do get quite a few Japanese beetles um, here in the city, but the willow are so tough that they seem to be able to handle it, even, even if we lose a lot of leaf um, leaves to Japanese beetles during that season when they're out. They've, uh, these willows have withstood that. So, um, one other thing, and then we'll we'll move on to my next thought. But uh, so we we planted these hedges in uh, spring of 2015, and um, sadly, in uh, by the next year, um, they were completely inni annihilated by rabbits and deer, and so we had to completely replant and cage everything because the deer and rabbits in town were so bad on our property, you know, way worse than out in the country. Who, you know, who would think? Um, you can't really, uh, can't really tell what's going on in the foreground too well, but actually those are a couple stretches of landscape fabric where there were supposed to be other rows of willows. There's a lone uh, survivor or two on the right hand side of a variety of willow um, that got decimated by rabbits. And we just didn't, when we were focusing on replanting the giant pussy willow hedges, these front ones got left out and we just never replanted. So yeah, that's my <laughs> little deer rabbit story about that. Um, so behind the curly willow or behind the, um, Pussy willow hedges. We have uh, we have a little curly willow garden um, right here, and these should be these should really be a lot bigger right now. They've gotten eaten down by deer several times, rubbed um, or rabbit damage. We actually I think re replanted a lot of these as well, and we started these from potted stock, 
And um, I, can, I can tell you that with, in my experience with Willow, um, Willows establish so much faster and so much better from cuttings rather than potted stock. I don't know why that is. Um, you know, you'd think it might be the opposite. It wasn't huge potted stock. It should have adapted quickly, but um, if I had planted those trees as cuttings, they would be probably triple the size they are now. Okay, so I'm going to talk mainly today about the um, Japanese pussy willow or giant pussy willow. This, this is such a wonderful variety because it has multi-season interest. Um, here we see um, these branches were actually um, a batch that I forced for a large event um, that I supplied in December. And so um, it seems like we were always ending up doing sort of creative things like that. We weren't really a volume seller but we did a lot of uh, a lot of hustling with our willow. Um, this was for an event where they needed something like a thousand pussy willow stems for a December wedding, and so we uh, we had to figure out how to get these to force these to bloom in December. And you know you can absolutely do that. You need to you know get them cut a little earlier and get them in water and get them a little, um, let them sit in water at room temperature or a little cooler for, um, it'll, it'll vary depending on when you're trying to do it, but I think it took about 10 days or two weeks and we were able to actually force these so they were fresh and beautiful in December. Uh, this is what I love about this variety of pussy willow, um, the red bud casings um, in the winter. You, these, these are really, um, have a lot of value for uh, florists and people who, sell, who create and sell um, decorative holiday planters. So the red, the red is great, obviously, for right around Christmas. Um, and by those planters, I mean like a big mass of sticks in the middle of a larger pot surrounded by evergreens. Um, these are, uh, I just love how beautiful these are in winter. Um, even, even now, I this is just like a few days ago, even now the uh, bud casings start to blush up and they do have some value for florists in the fall. Okay, so um, the thing with this variety that, that I kind of learned um, from growing it and harvesting it many seasons is that it's a very early blooming variety and if you have a, a very warm and early spring, these just start to go crazy and you have such, such a tight window to get these cut because you don't want to, um, you're pretty much done, it's over if there's even a hint of pollen on any of these catkins and that just happens really, really fast. So, um, Compared to the standard like American pussy willow, these, these bloom so much faster and the window just seems so tight. Um, I have always scrambled to get everything cut that, that I wanted to get cut. Um, the kind of nice thing is, is if you can get them cut in time well in advance of the pollen formation, then um, you, know, you, can, um, you can process them you can sell them, you can, you can ship them in bundles of 25 or 50 in, four, in uh, four, three or four foot boxes, um, four by four or six by six. They ship really easily. They don't even weigh that much. Um, so you can, you can ship fresh branches and then whatever you have left over, 
you can bundle up and place somewhere to dry, like, like a barn or a cool out building um, for, uh, for use uh, selling um, at farmer's markets. Pussy willow I found is a very nostalgic plant. A lot of older people like it. Um, they grew up uh, go, taking, taking drives out in the country and being able to reliably see it in the ditches in the country. And now that's not really the case anymore since, since crops are grown so close to the roads and a lot of, a lot of the, um, the native American pussy willow is just kind of gone now. So um, it's very nostalgic and a lot of older people have passed that nostalgia on to their kids and grandkids. And so um, it's, it's popular uh, and it's not very widely available. So I was surprised at the success I had selling this dried at farmer's markets um, out of season. It was, it was a pretty successful item. Uh, uh, just a few words, um, leaf stripping. So I wasn't doing, um, I was kind of trying to, to market my branches year round, whether that was pussy willow or uh, curly willow. Uh, mostly curly willow in the summer, you can sell that, um, but you have to strip the leaves. And it can be kind of a labor intensive to do that, but I've done it a lot. Um, I've processed 500 or 1,000 branches like that, and you wanna you wanna wear some gloves if you're gonna be stripping that many. Uh, cuttings. So this this was a this was a super easy to process item that we we were pretty successful in marketing online. Um, here. Uh, this was an offering we had that was our most popular four different varieties of curly willow and so we would we would um box these up in little bundles with planting instructions and um, people could establish their own willow plantings uh at a at a really good price so It's worth it if you have the time to try to uh, play around with some things like that. Uh, wreaths. So here, here's a couple different wreaths that we made from Curly Willow. Um, the value add with Willow, um, you can also do these with Pussy Willow turned out to be a really good item for us. We could not keep up with the, with, uh, the demand for these. Um, they're pretty labor intensive to make. I'll show you, um, show you how we made them. We had a little um, wreath crimper and then you would just buy these um, metal wreath forms with prongs and it's, it takes a lot of material, it takes a lot of the right parts of willow to make these to look good. And I guess playing around until you, you feel like you got it down. But um, these were something that you could, you know, we sold these for like $85 and um, couldn't, couldn't meet the demand. So we also didn't make a ton of them because like I said, they're, they're very labor intensive. Um, okay, that's, that's about all I have. Um, I just want to say that um, I'm, I'm really happy to, to share more info um, and even cuttings if you want to reach out to me uh, via, via email. I'm happy to share. Great. Thanks, Anne. Just share my last slide here um, and I'll make a couple comments here just about this slide and then we'll move into questions. Um, but I wanted to put a plug in for this book, uh, which I got in the beginning of this project um, and shared with a couple of the growers we're working with. Uh, and I just think it's phenomenal. It's, uh, it's one of those books where the front half is kind of some of the general 
planting uh, instructions and uh, kind of guidance on growing these types of plants. Uh, and then the back half is just an index of crop by crop, um, species by species, what are the, you know, what are in their minds the best varieties of those species, uh, plant spacing guidelines, harvesting guidelines, uh, marketing guidelines. So I, I think it's a, it's a really helpful book for those that are looking to start growing these. Uh, and one, really one of the few resources uh, out there. So it's seventy dollars. It's available at the uh, American Specialty Cut Flower Grower Association. Um, it's they did another printing of them, so they're not super available, um, but they have them on that website still. Uh, so just a plug for that book. And um, I wanted to open up for questions here at the end. If anyone has anything they'd like to ask, you can either feel free to put uh, your question in the chat box. Um, or if you'd like, you're welcome to unmute yourself and um, ask any questions you might have. While people are thinking maybe what they want to ask, I was going to um, ask you, and uh, were you, did you, initially go into kind of mailing things or do, were you trying to sell them more locally in the beginning? Did it seem obvious that you kind of go right into trying to distribute more through eBay and Etsy? Yeah, well, um, I think um, online was my only outlet in the beginning. I hadn't been doing um, farmer's markets at that point or even um, trying to sell much locally. I think I did I did sell some curly willow branches and cuttings on Craigslist, but locally, but, uh, but yeah, online was my only outlet in the beginning. Well, and when you were marketing, you talked about the cuttings versus the kind of the full product, I guess, of like the, the forced willows or whatever it might be. Did you price those differently or how did you, how did you price those differently? Okay, you mean like maybe a forced blooming branch versus? I guess um, the branch is a product or the, the planting stock is a product. How did you think about those differently in terms of pricing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I was looking at um, offerings online that other people were selling and seeing how they were priced, mm -hmm. but the cuttings themselves, they were just really the bottom of the branch um, a certain diameter and, um, they, they were priced a lot lower than, than the full branches. I can't tell you exactly, um, how, how much, how much less I would charge. It's been, a, been a few yeah. years now. So. Yeah. Great. And Calvin, I wanted to ask you about the, so whereas Anne was mostly selling online, you're going out and kind of working with florists um, and I imagine maybe selling some at the markets as well. Um, so how did you make those decisions about what you initially were planting um, in terms of, of the, the crops and the species and how did you think about marketing those to those florists in the beginning? Oh, I mean, basically just asked them what they would want us to plant and provide. I mean, that's the best way to do it, I would say. Customer's always right. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's been a demand. They've been asking for red twig dogwoods and willows of all types, I think is in pretty high demand from florists, especially locally grown ones. Mm -hmm. And growers that they know can produce quality cuts at a competitive price compared to wholesalers. So, yeah. And doing them this for, you said around 10 years, have you seen the market changing at all over that time? Um, I haven't only been doing it for about three years. My mom would be the one to ask about that or someone with a little more experience, yeah. but I, I think Woody's have kind of always been in demand. I couldn't say, I mean, I've been asked multiple years now going back to when I started. So the last three years they've been asking, but I just haven't gotten around to doing it. So I think there's always been a pretty solid demand and I don't think it would, I don't think it's going to go anywhere either. I don't think it's going to dry up out of the blue. So. 
I wanted to ask you too, you're talking about only harvesting 30% of the, the plant each time you go out. So that, that 70% that you leave, are you harvesting that the next year or is that kind of, is there a, kind of a consistent amount that's just always, you know, the perpetual growth of the plant? Yeah, I think you just don't want to overcut it. So, I mean, yeah, you don't want to overcut and harm it for next year so that you don't get as much regrowth, especially on the red twig dogwoods. For willows, I imagine it's probably not as big a deal just because they're so big. Mm -hmm. But the red twig dogwoods are more, they're smaller. So just not overcutting. And yeah, I mean, you're going to want to clip the ones that, not the brand new ones that come back the next year. But I think with enough experience, you can probably cut like two foot branches are the ones you're going for. Mm -hmm. You know, because the ones that are new are going to be shorter. So just once they reach a certain length, I would be cutting those and allowing for the new growth to mature. Sure. Is that kind of your approach too, Anne, with harvesting? Yeah, so we're, we're just growing willows and, and uh, like Calvin said, the willows, the, the willows are huge. And I found that it doesn't, doesn't much matter how much you harvest. Um, you do get um, on the giant pussy willow, you do get some different things that happen if you if you um, leave some uncut. You might get um, you might get some some more branching than you would have if you than on the cut stems. Um, you might get smaller catkins on branches that were left for a couple of years without being cut. So mm -hmm. yeah, little, there's some nuances there. Yeah. And you mentioned, I wanted to see, is there an easy kind of tip you talked about with the curly willows, or sorry, the, the pussy willows when that, those catkins are coming on um, and blooming, is there a sign of when it's about to shift and start producing that pollen? Or are you just trying to kind of, when do you start harvesting? Like yeah, so the not. earlier the better, I would say, um, you know, even as early as sometime in January. Um, it's all, um, this variety, I guess all the varieties of Pussy Willow have uh, catkins that kind of emerge here and there on warm, sunny days, um, just kind of sporadically, and then they, then they go back into their, their casing. But when you start seeing more and more of those, come out on the sunny days mm -hmm. um, and if the temperatures just start warming up then you know you need to get out there and and get on it because kind of what happens um, is the the catkins will as as they get plumper and plumper they'll start to I think this might be on the on male plants they'll start to actually turn more gray than white too. And that's not gonna dry very well, or it might not look as nice as the nice uh, bright white, uh, fresh catkins. Mm -hmm. So if you start, you know, it's just like kind of looking at them every day and seeing what's going on. If you start seeing any hints of that, or if you start seeing more and more catkins popping out, you, you know it's time to, to get all cut that you wanna get cut um quickly yeah and what usually when when is that happening is that like march april is when those are starting to happening or later than that yeah so april's too late already so this okay. is like um this could be february early march yeah. and then you might be done on a really warm year then yeah. and then what's strange is we we have some of the we have some more standard pussy willow varieties on our property as well and those are so late blooming compared to this Japanese hmm. um, giant pussy willow. Um, you know, it, some of those other varieties might even be, might even bloom two months later. Hmm. So it's very early. Yeah. Um, also um, on that first photo of that kind of unusual uh, tiny pink cat can on the blonde wood, um, those have a very, very short window for harvesting um, because, you know, you want to get them when they look like that. They're at their, 
they're at their best looking when you, if you can cut them at that point. Unfortunately, they don't dry. It's a pretty fleeting thing to enjoy fresh. They don't mm. dry well. Um, then, you know, as they mature, left, left on the, uh, left uncut, um, those actually grow, the catkins get bigger and uh, are longer, kind of elongated and grayer, they lose that nice pink tint. So um, that's a, you know, it's a beautiful branch, but really fleeting. And um, those probably doesn't have a lot of market value. Great. Does anybody have anything they want to ask Calvin or Ian before we close up for the day? Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, thanks, Calvin. Thanks, Ann, um, for sharing your, your advice and expertise in this uh, Woody Ornamental uh, production. Um, all of our contact information here is, uh, is on the page here. Um, please reach out to any of us with any questions. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you.